The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never-before-seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame. Automate the hunt. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Make sure you check out some of our on-demand material. Some of our previously recorded webcasts have been archived on our on-demand website, which is securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Logarithm, Endgame, Stealth Bits, Signal Sciences, Javelin, who is doing the technical segment, Black Hills Information Security, Domain Tools, have all done on-demand webcasts that are available, so make sure you go check those out. Eyal Nimani is making a triumphant return to the show to perform a technical segment. Eyal, welcome back to Paul Security Weekly. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. And so um, we're going to talk about, uh, we were actually just talking about it during the break, uh, and because uh, uh, we do other shows that more closely follow the industry, we were talking about the solutions for it's really like four things uh that i would love to space into that you may have adopted some solutions for and that is the identity side identity and access side um the privileged identity management side and usually those also come with some kind of credential or password vault uh so we call the space privilege identity management uh identity and access management uh and then they typically have some kind of vaulting uh technology so I'm glad you got all those buzzwords out of the way at the beginning. Got all the buzzwords out of the way at the beginning. Well, because it sets the stage for y'all. So I wanted you to describe for our, our listeners, um, you know, some of the, the limitations that you found with some of these uh, solutions on the market today. Yes, sure. So just, let's just jump to it. Um, I'll share my screen. Let's get right to it. I like it. Mm -hmm. It's a good drink, too. Oh, thank you. It needed the lemon. I like the lemon. It did need it the did. lemon. It's good. It's a hard job go. that we have here, y'all, you know, sipping cocktails and smoking cigars <laughs> and allowing you to do all of the technical heavy lifting. So. There we go. <laughs> all right. I um, see your screen. Okay, so just like Paul mentioned, so in this presentation, I will review the effectiveness of jump servers, uh, which is our access management, and PIM solutions, uh, identity management solutions, in terms of securing AD networks against credential theft scenarios. And I will discuss what problems it managed to tackle and what attack scenarios it cannot mitigate. So first, we will describe the current leading solutions in the market, uh, their goals, their implementations. And then we will address any relevant attack scenarios that these solutions uh, cannot mitigate and attackers are able to bypass easily uh, using publicly known tools. So first of all, let's start with the uh, market names and vendors. So uh, the current absurd situation here is that many cybersecurity experts still believe that the most effective and common solutions in the market to secure your uh, domain against credential theft scenarios are just by implementing, uh, implementing uh, privileged account management products uh, like PAM or PIM um, and combine with, uh, with the access management the jump servers uh, for secured remote access. So combined with uh, another uh, solution, usually a vault of some kind, uh, that vault secures your domain secrets. Uh, it's also known as an enterprise vault or a secret server. These vendors still claim that their solution can stop attackers from stealing credentials and using them to move laterally in your domain enterprise environment. Uh, so AL, unfortunately, I just, sorry, I want to yeah. go back to the jump server. Um, that is, I don't want to say it replaces your VPN, but it eliminates the need for a VPN service in certain circumstances, correct? Yes, but only in some of them, because most of the people just using uh, the jump servers, maybe doing the first, like the first step will be VPN, mm -hmm. and they will initiate RDP uh, into one of their target servers. Okay, so, gotcha. 
So there, yeah, there are many services that you can use uh, through that jump server or jump box. Um, so um, just like I mentioned, attackers can still bypass this kind of protection mechanism using uh, just the same techniques as before, but just using just uh, a little bit different ways. So just to clarify, I won't mention any specific vendor name today or any specific brand uh, by one of these vendors, um, but the entire content and research is based on the leading solutions right now available on the market. So let's start. Uh, first of all, um, the main goals of these products, again, is to allow continuous monitoring, recording, management of privileged accounts and administrator access across the network. <laughs> Uh, and that includes also third-party vendors access and managing service accounts. Um, they also do it with active auditing and logging of all forms of privileged user access. That means that everything that you're doing uh, when you're accessing your privileged account through the vault, through the management solution, through the, through the jump server, everything is usually recorded and monitored. Um, and when you're doing that, they also can limit the amount of time uh, that you are allowed to uh, use one of these users. Um, also, they are removing and restricting local administrative access for businesses and IT users. Uh, so right now, users can access and run applications without actually being a, a domain or a local administrators. So this is how it actually looks like. Um, right now, what you're seeing is uh, how um, the enterprise vault is, operates uh, together with the privileged account management, also known as PAM. So it operates um, with the main purpose of uh, rotating privileged admin accounts password and service accounts with complex passwords that will be harder to guess or crack. Um, because they are managed by a machine and not a human, therefore the, the password that the, the account management solution creates is much more complicated, uh, it's longer and much more harder to crack or guess, uh, for example. So um, instead of the users actually having to type their password, they're receiving a one-time password uh, through the interface when they just log in um, to the vault, like with, with system user interface, just for the vault and then they will receive a one-time password for their desired action for whatever user they're using. Um, so let's say that you want to access um, any resource or asset inside your domain. Um, so after you're choosing what account you want to use, then you'll be redirected to a jump server. Um, and the jump server will automatically pop a new active session directly from the Vault interface, logging you as the managed account you chose. And one of the capabilities of these uh, techniques, of this uh, Enterprise Vault, is that they're also able to manage your Microsoft and third-party application service account, uh, but only if they're supporting it. So once they change this application's account password, they also need to actively re-enter it uh, inside all of your services, and they're doing it with an active agent in, uh, in some way, some kinds. Like uh, they're also using WMI to set your account's new password after it changes. And uh, that's about it. So just to recap, the main feature of software the vault and the PAM is to change your password per periodically, uh, sets complicated password, and from now on, privileged accounts won't be privileged users uh, won't be able to know uh, the real password in order to use it. Instead, it's just being copied automatically under the hood and being used without the user's knowledge. Um, and another feature is also when you're when you're authenticating with the vault, you actually have like multi-factor login option for the management interface, right? So there's like an, another uh, barrier of security when logging to the vault instead of just typing your password, your domain password. Um, another thing is it also capable of 
automatically configure your service account passwords inside your uh, your environment. So everything is just done automatically by your management console, um, which is very very cool, very convenient. So another feature is called the jump server. So how does the jump server techniques work? So when you're connecting via the RDP uh, to a remote server, you won't log in directly uh, to the remote server. Instead, you will be forwarded to a secure jump server from which you will open a new RDP uh, inside that jump server session. And eventually what you have is like an RDP inside an RDP session. So that's how they protecting against some kind of credential theft uh, of that managed password from your source workstation, uh, which is the endpoint that you are connecting from. But there's one risk they're not telling you here is that when you're using um, jump servers to connect, your managed credentials are still exposed in your destination server, which is the server that you are connecting to. So, for example, the flow for connecting to any remote server will be first logging into the management portal, uh, then choosing what remote endpoint to connect to. After that, you'll be choosing the privileged account to connect with. So this can also be like local administrator or any domain administrator. Um, then you'll be choosing the required service to connect to. So this can be RDP or any other terminal solution, VPN. Um, and then finally, uh, you'll be connected to the jump server, which will also open automatically uh, a new RDP connection to the remote server. And their feature, like, like I mentioned before, is that also these sessions can be recorded and monitored. And eventually what you have is an RDP inside an RDP session. And Eyal, there, uh, really any user can use this jump server that is sanctioned uh, to use it. Um, as I know, like in some cases, it only allows for like sharing. In other words, if AL, I was to let you access to my screen and use a jump server, like we'd both like mm -hmm. connect to the jump server and then I'd, I'd have to be on the session with you. Um, right. Does it work like that? Or in, in a lot of solutions does basically like you can log into my system at any time. So basically, yeah, you can just log into the system at any time. Okay, gotcha. So, so All right, so just like mm -hmm. uh, G, uh, GGI, just enough, uh, just in time, and just enough administration, right? So yeah, I'll get only the permissions that I need, only for this a lot of time. Now, and typically, what you'll see in the logs, at least in Windows, is you'll see kind of like two logon sessions happen but they'll have a, a, the flag for privilege or, or unprivileged, and sometimes the username will have a, a GUID attached to it. Right, so yeah, both users can log in simultaneously, it just doesn't matter. Uh, Windows can handle it, um, regardless of, for, of the, <laughs> the jump server solution. So um, let's talk about credential theft right now. So the truth is now kind of revealed. Uh, it's not enough to stop credential theft because considering that all of the circumstances where these solutions are applied and the fact remains that the credentials are still exposed in the destination server uh, when using these kind of solutions. So when, lo when logging in uh, using a jump server, your credentials are left exposed in the memory of the destination remote server, just like uh, if you connected with like without jump server, this is the same thing. Uh, even if even if it's a managed account, there is still a risk that an adversary will steal your credentials and use them to create privileged domain persistency that is isn't managed by the PIM. Uh, by that time, your entire domain will be compromised. So you, you can even get a better effect of not having credential exposed in the target side of the connection if you're applying like Microsoft built-in protections uh, when you're connecting uh, to to another remote service like Credentials Guard. Uh, RDP using restricted admins, and a new feature uh, introduced in Windows 10, which is called uh, Remote Guard. Um, this will not cost you nothing, but uh, they also require a little bit uh, more of uh, IT effort to, to force all the users uh, to work with these kind of features. Um, so 
another key issue here is that the management server is changing, retaining the password of these privileged users. But once you're authenticated using a Kerberos uh, protocol, you receive a TGT ticket from your domain controller. This TGT indicates an already authenticated token that doesn't need to re be revalidated. So, Eyal, uh, sorry, I want to go back mm -hmm. to that because one of the, I think, selling points to all of the solutions on the market is that once they temporarily grant access for an individual to a system for a period of time, that they can then mm -hmm. revoke access and the password's automatically changed after that time because right. they don't need the password because they're using the, um, y you know, this technology. So, uh, but what you're saying is that the, the Kerbero, underneath the, the hood and the Kerbero side, th that's what's allowing for attacks to take place? Right. So gotcha. regardless of your password rotating mechanisms, uh, the TGT ticket have a life of, of its own, so it's not um, it's not configured by your management solution. It's only configured by the GPO policy, so which is on default like 10 hours. So no matter what you uh, what you did on your PAM, what you configured on PAM, when you're going uh, to change your password, if it's whether if it's uh, immediately after closing the session or after a few minutes, uh, it doesn't matter because attackers can steal, uh, steal the the TGT ticket uh, of your managed account credential, the privileged one, and perform the pass the ticket uh, attack that we know for so long. So this is only one scenario, and of course, um, usually what you're configuring with your PAM is that the password are changed periodically, and usually it's not. It's not hourly or it's not minutes. It's like more daily rotation of the password. So also during this time, you can steal the hash, but the more powerful technique is just stealing the, the TGT ticket and um, elevate your privileges inside the domain. Um, another feature that, uh, that these solutions uh, contains is something uh, called automatic service accounts uh, setting. So also all of your service accounts are managed by the PAM, by the identity manager and account manager, uh, and their password are changed uh, periodically. And it's also being set automatically by the PAM inside all of your application, all of your servers. So um, is it enough to stop Kerber hosting? So also, just like to mention again, um, Kerber hosting is an attack which is you can request from anywhere from the domain a, a service account uh, ticket. And you can use this ticket to, to crack it locally and um, isolate the hash of the associated service account of this ticket. And eventually what you get is just like a, a domain hash and password eventually if you are able to crack it. So uh, even if your service accounts are managed, attackers can still crack their credentials using a technique called Kerber hosting. So because your uh, service accounts are associated with a TGS ticket and it can be requested by anyone in the domain and they're encrypted with the, with the NTLM hash password, uh, with the easy to, to crack uh, encryption method like RC4 or MD5, then attackers just can grab it and crack it offline without any interaction from the domain controller. So despite having PAM implemented in many companies' networks, mentors are always report that they managed to crack some unsupported and unmanaged service account. Um, and the leading vendors aren't capable of managing all of the service, right? Because there are many applications in the market which they cannot support. Therefore, if you only get one unmanaged privileged service account credentials, uh, it's enough to compromise the domain. So, um, in any terms, if the service account password is unmanaged, it will usually be much more easier to crack uh, because defenders, um, for example, if it's managed, then you have much more characters and much more complicated char set. So, um, I will review it briefly how long it's going to take you to crack one of these passwords. Um, yeah, so this slide is just describes um, 
like what's the dependency of the the char set length and uh, the complications that eventually, if you can see, uh, only if you have 11 char set and above, um, the, the hash is becoming impossible to crack. So this is just to, clar to clarify and give you an assumption about how long it will take you to crack one of these Kerber hosting tickets. So uh, it really depends on how long the service accounts password are. If you're using a solid kit of eight GTX uh, 1080 GPUs, you can crack a seven character password uh, in 17 seconds. So this is equal equals to no encryption at all. There's a zero barrier to steal the service accounts unless they're using at least 11 characters. Um, so we, we also found that the majority of PAM solutions right now doesn't force this password length. So even if it's managed, then it still uh, can be cracked. And by the way, you don't have to really own one of these cracking kits. You don't have to own the, the, the eight GTX uh, uh, 1080 GPUs. You can just like uh, crack it online uh, there are many services that offering uh, offering people to to crack the hashes for a small payment. So and they just do it for you in a few seconds. You will receive the the password of the stolen user, and that's about it. So so you know, is, is this attack now yep. specifically then uh, focused on service accounts? Yeah, okay. exactly. So. Um, so because, just a recap, because the service accounts uh, can be requested by anyone in the domain, regardless mm -hmm. of uh, of any privileges, you just have to, uh, you got to have just a connection to the domain, and you can just use it and crack it locally and extract the hash of the uh, service account, and then you can just forward it uh, to any online service to crack it. And eventually what you get is a privileged domain user which was supposed to be uh, contained and managed by, uh, by the PAM, but the reality is it, it can be cracked. So another thing, another, uh, another threat is keylogging. So assuming the source computer is infected, which is uh, the endpoint user will request the logon to receive a temporary privilege to use. So in this case, we can just create a keylogging malware to record the login credentials to the PAM. Or even worse, uh, when you actually when you're using the password vault. So the vault when you're clicking, hey, give the password. Uh, so it just copies uh, the privileged account password in clear text to the clipboard. So what the attackers can do is just steal those credentials uh, immediately from the from the clipboard. So for example, you can just use open source projects like Get Clipboard Content PowerShell Script and reveal the use vault passwords in clear text. So this technique was also presented in the recent uh, DEF CON by Sean Metcalf. Another cool scenario that you're seeing here um, that's used by attackers a lot and cannot be mitigated by uh, Jam servers and PAM is called process token stealing. So let's say that one, your PIM and jump servers are fully deployed and your entire domain accounts, service accounts, applications, and service are managed. Two, uh, all, all of your domain admins are using the jump server to interact with the remote endpoints and services. And three, you have a Red Forest domain design. Four, you have, uh, you're using protected users group for powerful accounts. So you're doing everything by the book. Even your Kerberos uh, ticket validation policy is set to minimal exposure. Uh, you're still open for these kind of attacks. Um, so, assuming all of the conditions are met, attacker will still be able to hijack live sessions of your admins uh, with method called token manipulation, or another th method called uh, RDP or session hijacking. So both are implemented in the Mimikatz tool, just like you're seeing here, um, by using the command token uh, elevate slash domain admin. Uh, if there's anyone connected to the target computer you're at, uh, you can just hijack his uh, token and eventually compromise his credentials. 
So just like I mentioned before, the other method called uh, RDP or Terminal Services Session Hijacking. So RDP hijack is based on the fact that anyone with local high privileges can control and connect to any other remote sessions if you are on the same machines. So normally, in order to switch between sessions in the same server, uh, you have to re-enter the credentials again. But however, in this technique, you can elevate your privileges, uh, your local privileges to system just by using any kind of, uh, of exploit or just by using Mimikatz. Uh, and then you can just connect to any live uh, RDP session inside your computer, inside your server, uh, without having to re-enter the password for it. So let's say that John and me is connecting on the same server uh, I can basically just hijack John's, uh, John's uh, session without his permission, without knowing his password. That's just the reality. This is this is just Microsoft behavior. This vulnerability exists in any Windows machine, and no that, matter and what version. That's and that's specific to RDP. That's specific to RDP. Okay, and not any kind of privilege identity management system, right? Um, so what I'm saying here is that even if you're using uh, identity management and then you're using the jump server to connect uh, mm -hmm. to the target uh, service, uh, your jump server protected RDP session can be hijacked. Okay. So another key issue that we have is that who will protect your security vendors? So even... After all of these uh, problems, there's still one more issue that emerges uh, once you deploy a PAM solution. So as a defender from now on, you have another crown jewel of your domain, which is, isn't only the domain controller. So if you as an attacker, you can f try to find vulnerabilities or just uh, hunt the PIM, the, the identity management server, uh, operators of the server, uh, it can benefit attackers and impose a big security risk to your network. So you have just added another attack vector and persistence mechanism inside your environment that is more concealed than the domain controller itself. So if an attacker has managed to reach one of your PAM administrators, he basically compromised your entire domain, right? Uh, logging into a web console with multi-factor authentication isn't enough to protect you from the attacker. This threat becoming a reality because just recently, uh, I think on April, um, one product of a leading vendor was exposed to a critical vulnerability that allowed anyone to execute code uh, on the application Vault server. So this server, uh, it stores all of your domain secrets, right? So what it actually means is that all of your domain assets are exposed um, if you can gain uh, this kind of access to the server, and which means is on the first initial infection of your domain, uh, any endpoint that have connection to the vault server uh, basically can hijack it and steal all the all your domain secret and eventually just compromise your domain on the first step. So you can see uh, the screenshot here from Exploit DB. This is publicly available uh, for anyone to use. So again, RCE to the vault, what it actually means. First of all, uh, like I mentioned, it exposed all of your domain secrets and it exposed all the credentials of the user vault uh, or the managers of the vault. And basically this is a complete ownage of the domain with the first exposed user. So this is a paradise for attackers. Uh, once attacker get these domain uh, secrets from the vault, which are usually domain admin credentials, and all the, uh, all the privileged accounts of your domains, uh, they have direct access to your most sensitive domain assets. Uh, my next step as an attacker will be just remove that requirement of having access to the vault and just performing the DC sync attack straight to the DC, uh, gathering at the golden ticket, and that's about it. I've, I've owned the domain in the first step. So the, the vulnerabilities doesn't have to be like vulnerability inside the vault. You can also find vulnerabilities uh, inside the Windows server of the vault, right? You, it's just a matter of getting access to the vault. So a recap to everything that I just mentioned here. Uh, if you have a foothold on the target server, that means that 
you can steal the TGT ticket of, uh, of the of the connected user because the validation isn't associated with a password and role, and they have their own lifetime. Stealing them still works. The hashes and password are still valid as your password and role. Uh, this gives the attacker a small window to steal those credentials from the target servers. Uh, and other techniques that still works perfectly are the token manipulation and hard EP session hijacking. And one thing that I haven't mentioned before, um, you can also steal the service account's passwords straight from the registry um, if you're compromising one of the servers that contains that service account. And if you have your food all inside your, the, the source endpoint, uh, you can just use keyloggers to capture the PAM logging credentials uh, if you don't have multi-factor authentication activated. Um, you can also capture the clipboard uh, content when someone is using the PAM uh, and because the PAM is automatically copying the credentials straight to the keyboard and from there you just can use it, you get it in clear text. And, and also on the source endpoint, attackers can also perform the RDP terminal session hijacking and hijack the session to the jump server actually. And from anywhere in the domain, um, you can use all of these techniques from only if you have like network connectivity. So we're talking about uh, vulnerabilities to the vault servers. Uh, they can utilize either vulnerability in the Vault operating system and installed service or the actual vulnerability of the Vault, like I mentioned earlier. And from now on, attackers can hunt for PAM, PIM, Vault, Jump Servers, Admins. They are, ex they are uh, another crown jewel of the domain to, uh, to try to look for. And another thing is that it's still possible to perform Kerber hosting on unsupported uh, service accounts password, password credentials. Um, because these vendors cannot protect all of the, and support all of the service accounts right now in the market, all of the applications available in the market, then some of them probably will be vulnerable and not managed by the, the identity management. So the password will probably be much more easier to crack. Um, so as mentioned above, um, Password, anything that is less than seven characters can be, just be cracked in 17 seconds. So Kerber hosting is a key issue here that they don't solve. All right, so what, what I'm trying to bring here is that defenders still need to understand that it only takes one valid credentials to compromise the domain. And jump servers and identity management are not capable of stopping all of these evolving techniques we're seeing today in the AD Red teaming and attackers community. Um, anyway, to get more information about how to protect your credentials, perform domain recon and protect from it, um, please make sure to check our segment, other segments and also our webpage with more information about Javelin AD Protect. Uh, as you can see here, some of these scenarios are covered uh, with Javelin. Of course, you guys know I'm from Javelin, so I, I got to mention this. And that's it. Awesome. Questions for Yao? Anyone else? I have a few. Oh. Jeff? Um, <laughs> well, let's work backwards because my chance of remembering them all is pretty dim. Uh, <laughs> You're going to go LIFO. <laughs> I'm going to go LIFO. Uh, are you recommending uh, that companies, are they better off not using all these tools or are they better off using them just knowing that they have limitations? So in my opinion, I do recommend using these tools only because of one reason. They're, they're suited for, um, for the compliance of all of the current companies. So that's like they're fixing the direct spot that you do need to fix inside your environment. So I do recommend to use them, but you just got to know it doesn't solve uh, credential theft. I have to say, I mean, you know, while I was listening to you talk, I kept thinking, and you brought up some of the things during the course of your presentation, and I'm like, you know, I haven't done this kind of stuff in a long time, but it sure sounds a whole lot familiar with techniques that we were using 15, 20 years ago. Obviously, the technology and the targets have changed, but, mm -hmm. you know, 
grabbing tokens, you know, we used to call that replay attacks. And you did mention hijacking. I'm like, because I was like sitting here thinking, sure, sounds like a hijack attack is coming. Um, <coughs> a, a, a generic question, and you, you brought up compliance, and I went this far. I'm the PCI guy. Uh, and we've been debating uh, for the last couple months about passwords in general. You know, NIST came out with new guidance uh, that is sort of inconsistent with PCI compliance requirements for password length, complexity, and expiration. Um, if you were going to recommend the ideal password, uh, and I think I know what your answer would be, but I'm asking it anyway for the benefit of our audience, you know, what would you recommend in terms of, from the three aspects, length, complexity, and expiration, you know, what combination of those three or which would you emphasize? What, what should companies be pushing in terms of a decent password that's going to withstand as much of what you're, you're detailing here? Right. So my recommendation is, first of all, it doesn't, it, like, no way it should be obvious. Because if it's obvious, then it's going to be, like, previously cracked before and much more easier to crack uh, for future use. Mm -hmm. um, the complexity should be many uh, different characters possible. So all, all kind of char sets, symbols, uh, maybe like different languages if possible. And another thing is, of course, the length. So 11, at least 11 is a must. Size matters, Jeff. Size right. does right. matter. Size right. matters. Yep. <laughs> for passwords, passwords we're talking about. Exactly. And other things. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. And other <laughs> but if you were, I mean, I was I trying mean, to be subtle. Uh, yeah, but pass phrases. So like the longer your pass phrases. Too. Right, pass phrases. Yes. See? Yeah. Well, I'm good. I, you know, in I'm, the gutter. I'm the gutter. I'm leaning towards pass phrase, and you know why not make it? You know, you, you you your charts went up to eleven or at least eleven, but why not sixteen? Why not twenty? Twenty four? Thirty two? Then does complexity matter? And then does uh, how often you change the password? Does that matter as much? Or how 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 prevalent are all these other techniques at it, essentially stealing the password? Well, yeah. that's a that's a can of worms, and I think Yale's smiling because it, it's <laughs> it is a can of worms. But it, it, as you get the length past a certain uh, number of characters, I think in really any system you start to run into issues with compatibility. Right? Mm -hmm. Is it compatible with right. this previous authentication scheme in this previous version of Windows? If you have other applications that are relying on Active Directory for authentication or, or other systems that integrate, is it compatible with that? Eyal, is that is that still true today? How much of that do we have in, in the Active Directory world today? So I think it's only upgraded in the latest versions of the, the domain controllers, but if you want to use like the, the older versions, uh, 15 is the top length that you can use. Gotcha. More than that, it just... Yeah, it will break. Well, I mean, in the old days, it didn't matter how long you made your password. Unix only ha handled the first eight characters. And uh, yeah. Windows NTLM works the same way. Much the same way. Much the same way. Yeah. Is it eight? Was it eight? Yeah, the, the, the way I'd see it. LM. Sorry. Yes, Larry's right. It was yeah. LM. Sorry. It's been a while. Yeah. No one really uses... Do people use LM still? Yes. Probably. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Car I, I made Carlos that, is there. I made that mistake with, with talking about Modbus, too, because like, I'm like, wow, I mean, largely people have adopted newer protocols, and then, nope. No. Nope. No. Nope. Uh, nope. Car it, it, Carlos has Carlos. a comment in there. Yeah, the, the, the way I see it is that the gist of his presentation is very simple. Um, doesn't matter what tool you use, if you don't have good policies and good controls on the operating system itself, you're going to be having issues. Um, as you mentioned, hey, you're using the vault, vaults changing passwords, it's controlling the passwords. But if the attacker has a foothold on that critical server, the OS now becomes your, uh, has the attack surface of keeping those credentials in memory. And the technology that you use for those credentials, in the case of Windows, which is Kerberos in a domain environment, you have access to those uh, Kerberos tickets in memory. Now let's say that you're going SSH, on window uh, on Linux or Windows or any other device, if you're using the SSH agent, you're still vulnerable. SSH agent keeps credentials in memory in Linux. Uh, Open SSH does uh, in clear text. If I'm able to dump that memory, I have access now to your keys, and I have access to your keys that are 
uh, don't have the passphrase or encrypted applied to it. So I have access to it. So it is kind of like a shift from why am I going to find the vault system or the credential management system if I can just go to the OS and I still have that soft, mushy uh, middle that I can still go after. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, Eyal, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Uh, fantastic technical segment. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Paul. And with that, we'll take a short break and come back with the security news for this week. So stay tuned.